I would like to um, welcome uh, Vittorio Gallese. And I have to say that I'm deeply honored by, <laughs> by having Vittorio uh, with, with us. Good morning. And, Good morning. Uh, yes, we hear, we hear you. Uh, as uh, all respectful mostly, we are running out of power here, but <laughs> this uh, uh, doesn't stop them. And so let me uh, briefly introduce uh, uh, Victoria, which is one of the leading neuroscientists and which uh, is part of the team that uh, Chamo discovered one of the uh, most uh, um, interesting uh, development, I mean, um, in neuroscience in the last, uh, and not only of the field, but let's say <laughs> many, many things, the mirror neuron. And um, so uh, we, his uh, uh, talk uh, of uh, today, embodying images, embodied simulation, and aesthetic experience. And uh, Vittorio Galizzi is a full professor of Psychobiology at the Department of Medicine and Surgery, Neuroscience Unit of the University of Parma. As a neuroscientist, his main contribution includes the discovery, together with colleagues from Parma, of mirror neurons and the elaboration of a neuroscientific model of perception and intersubjectivity, embodied simulation theory. His scientific production is attested by more than 300 international publications the publication of two books as author and three books as editor. Vittorio uh, Gallese received many recognitions, recognitions and awards. He won the Grave Meyer Prize for Psychology for the year 2007, the Arnold Pfeffer Prize for Neuropsychoanalysis in New York in 2010, the Musati Prize for the Italian Psychoanalytic Society in 2014, and the Humboldt Forschung Prize on the Alexander von Humboldt Stiftung in Germany in 2019. He also received the Lauda Honoris Causa from the Catholic University of Leuven, Belgium, in 2010. And uh, so it's a pleasure and an honor to leave the floor to Victoria Gabriel. Thank you. So, good morning, uh, everyone. First of all, let me uh, uh, thank Professor Ripa Di Meana and the organizer of this summer school for inviting me and um, giving a talk uh, uh, today. And I would also take this opportunity to say hello uh, to the next speaker, uh, my friend Roberto Casati. We haven't been seeing e each other uh, since quite a while, but um, I'm happy that uh, we will uh, uh, meet at least uh, virtually uh, uh, through, uh, through Teams. Okay, so um, I decided to start with this image in spite of, uh, I don't know, a Mona Lisa, a Picasso, or a Caravaggio, just to introduce uh, uh, my take on aesthetics. When we think about aesthetics, we normally uh, think about a, a, a specific discipline in, in, the, in the humanities, which has a history, um, just a few centuries, uh, which normally refers to a specific category of man-made uh, uh, cultural artifacts that we learn, historically speaking, and as I said, quite recently, to designate as artworks. But human uh, uh, creativity, uh, the possibility to express ourselves uh, through cultural artifacts is much, much older than that. Um, for example, as old as this image, this little piece of ochre with this uh, uh, geometric engravings uh, uh, was found in the Blombos Cave near Cape Town in South Africa and is dated approximately 70,000 years before present. So I think that even from an empirical point of view, from my own specific idiosyncratic vantage point of uh, an empirical scientist, uh, uh, notably a neuroscientist, it makes more sense uh, to speak of art and artworks and aesthetic uh, from this um, more, more biologically plausible perspective, which includes cultural artifacts 
that uh, even if, uh, as we speak, are now displayed uh, uh, in museums uh, side by side with the other artworks I was mentioning before, most likely uh, when they were created uh, and used by our ancestor would have been designated uh, in a different manner. This is uh, 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 the uh, outline of what I would like to uh, say uh, uh, today. Uh, a brief introduction to aesthetics and aesthetic experience, which I already started introducing the image of my first slide. Then the embodiment of images, embodied simulation as a new model of perception and imagination. Uh, a quick tour of few empirical results from our lab and then some is obvious temporary conclusion because this uh, uh, is a field uh, uh, that is progressing uh, as we speak. OK, as I said, I, 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 when I speak of aesthetics, I want to bypass uh, this historically very uh, much confined definition of the discipline which uh, explores uh, the nature and the reception of artworks uh, to uh, deal more with a much broader notion of aesthetics and to do so, I would like to quote uh, the American philosopher Mark Johnson, who in this book, The Aesthetics of Dominion Thought, published in uh, 2018, wrote, begin quote, aesthetics extends broadly to encompass all the processes by which we enact meaning through perception, bodily movement, feeling, and imagination. In other words, all meaningful experience is aesthetic experience. End quote. So we are very close to the etymological sense of the words, aesthesis, which means the multimodal perception of the world through the body and, or better, through the body's senses. Uh, a few years ago, uh, in 2007, with David Friedberg, uh, an art historian at Columbia University, we published this paper, Motion, Emotion, and Empathy in Aesthetic Experience, where we uh, wanted to uh, sketch out uh, a potential empirical research agenda, starting from, uh, um, um, until then, quite uh, downplaying, if not entirely forgotten, uh, aspect of uh, the reception of cultural artifacts, namely the notion of Einfuhl, empathy. Um, uh, by the way, uh, the notion of Einfühlung was introduced in the cultural debate at the end of the 19th century in Germany, not referring to psychology or intersubjectivity, but specifically talking about the reception of artworks. And the name um, of the philosopher who did so was Robert Lischer. So in this paper, we uh, first uh, uh, wanted to put into parentheses, to bracket, the artistic dimension of visual works of art to focus rather on the embodied phenomena that are induced in the course of contemplating such works by virtue of their visual content. So any piece of art, any painting, any sculpture, any fresco, before being uh, um, an historically defined uh, work of art, is an image, a three-dimensional object. And in the paper, we illustrated the neural mechanism that potentially might underpin the empathetic power of images and show that embodied simulation and the empathetic feelings it generates as a crucial. Let me be clear, because it's easy uh, to move from this statement to the uh, uh, misunderstanding that uh, we claim that all there is in aesthetic experience is the activation of this uh, bodily mechanism, quite uh, the opposite. What we propose with this paper and the ensuing empirical research that follows and that continues in my lab as we speak is that if we want to make sense of our relationship with cultural artifacts, we cannot neglect uh, the bodily part of our reception. Of course, there are many other dimensions. There is the meaning that the artist wanted to convey in meaning uh, in in uh, making uh, that specific artwork in that specific manner with that specific outlook. There is our background. There is the cultural canon 
in which we live, which exert uh, uh, definitely a very strong uh, uh, influence on the way we uh, receive, uh, relate to those um, artworks. But this is definitely not the only game in town, as it has been maintained for decades uh, uh, in the debate in uh, uh, philosophy of art, art history, and aesthetics. We should not forget that we have to deal also with this bodily component, okay? I'm speaking about uh, uh, aesthetic experience. So what is an experience? And here I would like to refer to a quote from this wonderful, and if you allow me to say so, very modern book, although published in 1934 from John Dewey, Art as Experience. Begin quote. Experience is the result, the sign, and the reward of that interaction of organism and environment, which when it is carried to the full, is a transformation of interaction into participation and communication, which means that not all interactions qualify as experience. In order to uh, do so, they must be carried out to the full, leading to a transformation of interaction into participation and communication. So there is clearly a meaning making a, a, a component in experience uh, itself. Experience, which by the way, is a dimension of the human mind or of the human psyche or whatever term you come up with to uh, uh, describe uh, uh, the inner workings of, um, of our uh, uh, subjectivity. Uh, has been poorly investigated by cognitive neuroscience because what has tended to prevail in the last 70 years or so is a totally top-down account of human cognition which squares thought and meaning with language. Again, this is not clearly the only game in town. Another very interesting contribution uh, comes from uh, um, Hans Gumbrecht from Stanford University uh, 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 a historian of ideas, a, a comparatist, who published another uh, book that I warmly recommend to all of you, uh, in 204, The Production of Presence, What Meaning Cannot Convey. And the quote goes like that. What we call aesthetic experience always provides us with certain feelings of intensity we cannot find in the historically and culturally specific everyday words that we inhabit. So when the object of our experience are those specific objects that we now uh, 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 we call uh, artworks or cultural artifacts, uh, there is something particular, specific with respect to our relationship uh, with uh, uh, the physical aspects uh, of uh, uh, reality in our uh, mundane uh, relationship uh, uh, with the world. So. What we are trying to do with our uh, uh, experimental aesthetic approach is to search for the genesis of aesthetic experience. So, in other words, I believe that the experience of images, and in particular of artistic images, can be empirically studied to reveal its bodily and neurobiological grounding elements. And uh, this eventually, and hopefully, might lead uh, uh, also uh, to a second purchase, namely a better understanding of what the concepts we normally employ when referring to aesthetics and art are made of. Okay, so how do we embody images? In this paper, as I said, uh, we were focusing uh, uh, with David Friedberg uh, on the, the sensory motor empathic component of our relationship uh, with works of art. So basically, I propose an unconventional approach to the aesthetic experience of works of art. The uh, unconventionality of my approach stems from three starting assumptions, which are, let me add that, quite different from the mainstream neuroscientific approach to aesthetics, which normally goes under the tag neuroaesthetics. First point, vision is a process far more complex than the mere activation of the so-called visual brain. Why? Because our visual experience of the world is the outcome of multimodal, multisensory integration 
processes in which the motor system most of the time provides the glue uh, to accomplish this integration. The motor system, in, different, in, in, other, in other words, is a key player here. Second point, aesthetic experience must be framed within social cognition and intersubjectivity, as what we now call works of art and more broadly cultural artifacts are mediators of the relationship between the subjectivities of creators, the artists, and us as beholders. And third point, aesthetic experience can be qualified as a particular kind of social practice. So I'm challenging oculocentrism in aesthetics. As I said, vision is multimodal as it encompasses the activation of motor, somatosensory, emotion-related brain networks. But there's more to that. When you think about the motor system, you are led to believe that the motor system is there just to make our body move. This is certainly true. Uh, I'm not challenging this view uh, uh, since I'm a, I started my empirical investigation of the brain somehow 40 years ago, specifically studying uh, the relationship between the brain and movement. But we learn something more about the motor system. The motor system can be activated without the production of any movement. So when the motor system or part of it activates, but no movement is executed, the motor system is playing out our motor potentialities. And these motor potentialities are crucial to shape and define the world we perceive. Our brain body expresses the range of potential relationship with the world that lead to the establishment of a relational self. We are relational creatures. Our mind is a relational mind, modeling and delimiting the horizon of the world in which we live. We know and understand our world, our umwelt, by virtue of the relational potentialities instantiated by our body. And these relational potentialities instantiated by our body in turn shape and model the brain's sensory motor schemas. So our brain would be wired and function in a completely different way if our bodies would be different because adapted to a different physical world. For example, a physical world devoid of the force of gravity. And here are some examples coming from research uh, carried out in our lab exploring the premotor cortex of the macaque uh, uh, brain, which has significant uh, homologies, both in uh, anatomical and functional uh, uh, terms with the human brain. For example, in this area, we found neurons that control orienting and avoiding uh, movements of the head or uh, the arm, which nevertheless can be activated also when you apply tactile stimuli to the same body part, which is moved by the same neuron, or you move visual stimuli in the proximity of that very same body part. And some of these neurons are trimodal, as described by Graziano and Gross. So namely, they control the turning of the head of the animal. They respond to touch applied to the face of the animal, to visual uh, stimuli moving within this three-dimensional, very personal space toward the same body part, but also uh, to sound, uh, which are uh, uh, happening in the proximity of that same very personal uh, slice uh, uh, of space. Or canonical neurons that, you, uh, that we recorded from the ventral premotor cortex here, this neuron control the execution of skill goal-related grasping movements uh, of the hand, but they also respond when the macaque uh, is not doing anything but merely watching the same object whose grasping is motorically controlled by the very same neuron. So frontoparietal motor areas are neurally integrated not only to control action, but also to serve the function of building an integrated bodily formatted mapping of actions objects and locations to which actions are directed. 
So aesthetic experience of man-made images, as I said, is a mediated form of intersubjectivity. And through the discovery of mirror neurons, uh, we were able for the first time to describe the intercorporeal side of intersubjectivity. So mirror neurons are motor neurons controlling uh, 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 goal-related motor acts like grasping uh, a manipulable object, but they display also visual properties. So the same neuron that control grasping when executed by the macaque would respond also to grasping and uh, merely observe being executed by someone else. Our colleagues in Tübingen recently made another very interesting discovery. So the relevance of mapping the actions of others is so crucial for social animals as we are, as primates, that mirror neurons not only respond to the observation of an action uh, performed by a real uh, uh, agent uh, uh, present in flesh and blood in front of the macaque, but also to a representation of the action uh, through a video clip uh, displayed on a bidimensional computer screen. So even if we are dealing here with neurons recorded uh, in a species which is approximately 25 million years older than us in evolutionary terms, a species that is well before the invention of the human language, nevertheless, uh, actions can be mapped uh, in a macaque brain, not very dissimilarly from the way they are mapped when observed uh, in the natural environment. And here you have the example of two neurons recorded during the observation of the naturalistic action. It's the yellow uh, uh, dots and curve or the film action, which is the black curve and the black dots. Each dot is a single action potential. Half of the neurons respond slightly, but significantly more vigorously to the naturalistic action, but you see there is still a very strong response to the representation of the action. The remaining half show the very same intensity. For those of you who are interested to know more about uh, mirror neurons, we are celebrating, so to speak, the 30th anniversary of our first publication on this topic. You may refer to this review paper that we recently published in uh, Trends in Cognitive Science, Mirror Neurons, 30 years later, Implications and Application. The paper is uh, freely downloadable as it's open source. Okay, now let me shift quickly to our brain, the human brain. And in those 30 years, uh, many groups investigated uh, the presence of mirror mechanisms in the human brain, and the discovery is that uh, all these colored areas, again, parietal, premotor, um, uh, inferior frontal gyrus, they respond to the execution, to the observation, to the imagination of object-directed action, communicative action, and bodily movements. And even when we observe, and this is highly relevant for what will follow, what I am about to say about artworks, even when we look at a static image of an action, this also leads to the activation of the observer uh, motor system. The more dynamic is the static image of an action, the stronger the activation of the beholder uh, uh, brain, motor brain. But there's more than that. The mirror mechanism is not confined to actions, but along the years we were able to first demonstrate that the same logic applies to emotions like disgust or fear. Here's an example. This is the anterior insula. Those voxels that are activated when I feel subjective disgust are also activated when I watch the face of someone else uh, expressing disgust. Uh, with a typical disgust-like uh, facial grimaces. Or the same applied to touch. The very same somatosensory area, which map my own tactile sensation, is activated also when I observe an equivalent body part of someone else being touched. So the mirror mechanism maps the sensory aspects of action, emotion, or sensation of another onto the perceiver's own neural mapping of that action, emotion, or sensation. And this mapping enables one to perceive the action, emotion, 
or sensation of someone else or its representation as if performing that action or experiencing some content of that emotion or sensation. Of course, the overlap is never entirely uh, the same. Otherwise, we would not be able to disentangle who is who. I want to remind you that to empathize with someone, it means to feel inside the other that should keep its otherness status. If the boundary between self and other gets blurred or even disappear, we are not dealing with it, the proper intersubjectivity anymore. We are dealing with psychopathology. We are dealing with psychosis. So the bodily contingencies posed by the specific configuration of the human body not only constrain our behavior, I can sit, I can stand up, I can walk, I can run, but with my own body I cannot fly, for example, but also what neural mechanism can map. And uh, neural mechanism and more broadly embodied simulation, in my account, is one example of a peculiar way of functioning of our brain, namely reuse. By neural reuse, different brain areas participate in different functions through their dynamical engagement within different brain circuits. A given cognitive function can be supported by a variety of brain circuits. The newer in evolutionary term a cognitive function is the wider is the brain circuit underpinning. This view is uh, not yet mainstream in cognitive neuroscience. It is endorsed by colleagues like Michael Anderson, who published in uh, 12 years ago a very interesting paper in uh, BBS, uh, to which I refer those of you who want to get deeper into this topic. By neural reuse, it is implied that uh, if you think, for example, about language, the hypothesis being put forward here is that you will not find any single neurons in our brain which is specifically, univocally, uniquely dealing with language. Language is an adaptation, or better, to put it with Stephen Jay Gould, uh, it is an exaptation of pre-existing sensory motor mechanism. So, there is no specific module in the brain dealing exclusively with language. There are no specific modules in our brain dealing specifically and exclusively with mind reading and the like. I'm fully aware this is still uh, uh, not the mainstream view, but uh, it's getting momentum and we need to be patient. And in the following years, I think more and more colleagues uh, will uh, realize that uh, what they are dealing with as we speak uh, most of the time is a high-tech version of phrenology. So embodied simulation, my hypothesis. The activation of embodied simulation is the non-conscious recall of the background bodily knowledge that we recruit in several different situations, for some of which I gave you a few examples. When witnessing others' action and the expression of their emotion and sensory experiences, when remembering past experiences, when planning future actions, when engaging in fictional experiences, when processing linguistic descriptions of facts, actions, and events. So embodied simulation provides a unified account of nonverbal and verbal aspects of interpersonal relations that likely play an important role in shaping ourselves, its identity, and share cultural practices. It reveals a unified functional mechanism which connects physical reality with imaginary and fictional worlds and links at the functional level symbol making and symbol reception. So let's make one example. Let's take this image, this wonderful Caravaggio paint. This is a static image which nevertheless represent a variety of bodies and bodily postures and gestures and uh, facial expressions that tell a story. The more we stand in front of this uh, painting, the more we look at it, the more we behold it, 
the more we uh, get acquainted with the, with the narrative. So where does this narrative come from? Since there are no words at stake, there is no movement, there is a, a static image portraying bodies that convey the sense of expression, of emotion, of sensation, and of movement. Where are these meanings coming from? Through the movement captured in the image of an instant, this instant, the observer transforms the instant into the story of a movement that comes from the past and continues projected into the future. We recognize the instant as part of a movement that has a past and a future, as every movement we can perform observe or just imagine. The past is the movement that has taken that body or that limb up to the moment depicted in the image we are observing. What about the future? The future is the predictable spatial trajectory and the final point of arrival that body or limb will plausibly reach after a time inversely proportional to the kinetic energy deployed. And our brain body is very good at predicting what comes next. So embodied simulation transforms the image into the figure of a story. What about works of art that, where there's no body at stake, there's no face, there's no expression? For example, one Cocetto Spaziale by um, Lucio Fontana. When looking at the graphic signs, like the one we started with, we unconsciously simulate the gesture that has produced it. And this unconscious response includes bodily framing and sensory motor activation of the simulating kind. We demonstrated that with uh, handwritten signs like uh, Latin alphabet letter, uh, Chinese ideograms, and scribbles. Whenever we look at these graphic signs, the motor part of our brain that guides our hand movement activates. Our hands are still, we record the EMG and simultaneously the EG, the electrical activity of the beholder activation, the EMG, the muscles are silent, the motor brain is active. What's going on in our brain? A simulation of the gesture. And the same occurs when we look at uh, Lucio Fontana's cats on canvas or to the dynamic brush strokes of uh, Franz Klein, as we hypothesized uh, five or seven years earlier uh, with respect to the date of uh, the publication of these experiments in the theoretical paper I co-authored with David Friedberg and that I briefly mentioned at the beginning of my talk. Okay, but as I said, aesthetic experience is a uh, multi-layer process, it starts with uh, a basic uh, uh, sensory experience. There is an image out there, there are my senses here, so there is a, an optic flow, a chain of activation from the retina onwards, but as we saw, uh, this is not purely a matter of the visual brain, there's a lot more going on, but this is just one dimension. Then there is my attitude, my experience of a landscape, uh, my experience of an artwork can be dramatically different according to my psychological state. Try to listen to your best uh, uh, or most preferred uh, piece of music uh, when you are filling your tax form or when you are totally relaxed and you will come up with in these two instantiation of the very same perceptual experience of, of the same piece of music uh, with very different appreciations of it. And then there is the judgmental aspect of the aesthetic experience. How much do I like what I'm looking at? How much do I rate it to be artistically beautiful? And in a quarter of philosophy, for example, here is uh, one of the prominent uh, 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 protagonists of this judgmental aspect of aesthetic experience, Immanuel Kant, who devoted one of his three critiques 
uh, uh, specifically to judgment. Uh, um, when we are dealing with aesthetic judgment, how artistically beautiful is this painting, this sculpture, this monument, this landscape? Uh, uh, apparently, we are in a totally different ballpark with respect to the uh, empathic uh, engagement we might entertain with those very same perceptual objects. We are dealing with something that has to be detached, very removed from the body, from the emotion, from the sanction, blah, 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 blah. Is that really so? By, uh, by education, by training, and uh, 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 because of my attitude uh, as an experimentalist, when something is taken for granted, it's the beginning of a, a sort of earworms that is telling me, well, why don't we try to challenge this view, which is specifically what we did. Trying to answer this question, are bodily driven sensory motor processes involved in the explicit judgment of aesthetic beauty? So we come up in collaboration with art historian, David Friedberg and Elisabetta Fadda, who is uh, an art historian specialized in the Renaissance uh, and mannerism in our University of Parma, uh, with a very simple uh, uh, behavioral experiment. We were showing two types of uh, artworks, artworks portraying physical pain and artworks portraying a relaxed human face. The task was very simple. After a fixation cross of half a second, the image was projected on the computer screen for two seconds, and then this question appeared on the screen. How artistically beautiful do you think this image is? And uh, the task was to move, as I'm doing now, uh, the mouse from not at all beautiful or to the other end of the line extremely beautiful. And participants could watch images of pain or relaxed human faces. In one condition, they were performing the task as I'm doing it now. In the second block of trials, they were requ required to actively frown while watching the images, notably to contract tonically the corrugator supercilia, which is one of the facial muscles that normally contracts when you are in pain. And the results were quite interesting. Here you have the vast score about the aesthetic uh, rating of artistic beauty of the images in the two conditions, the images showing pain and the images showing neutral faces when the participants were relaxed or when the participants were frowning. And as you see, when they were frowning, they tended to see the images of pain as significantly more artistically beautiful with respect to when they rated the very same images with the relaxed face. But this manipulation of the beholder's facial muscles had no impact than when they were about uh, to rate uh, the artistic beauty of the neutral faces. There's also some interesting correlational results. Participants' empathetic traits and uh, art experience correlated directly with the amplitude of the motor enactment effect uh, on the aesthetic judgment, which means that uh, the people who scored uh, higher in terms of their uh, empathic traits and who were more into art. We are not dealing with artists here, but uh, the question of art experience is asking you, how many times do you visit a museum in, in, in every year? How many art exhibition uh, uh, you pay a visit to? How many book on art uh, you purchase every year and the like? So the more the art experience you are and the more empathetic you are, the strongest is the impact on your aesthetic judgment of beauty of this bodily manipulation. Okay, I, I will not claim that Kant, why Kant is wrong <laughs> on the basis of this very specific and limited uh, 
uh, case scenario, but it certainly induces me to do more experiments uh, uh, to verify whether and to which extent it is really true that uh, the aesthetic judgment uh, uh, of beauty of an artwork is a totally detached, entirely cognitive and linguistically mediated enterprise, or rather, again, uh, it involves our body. Uh, we also did uh, an fMRI experiments uh, to see what are the neural basis of this uh, effect that I just uh, show you. Uh, the visceral motor roots of aesthetic evaluation of pain in eye. This is also an open source uh, 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 paper that you can uh, uh, freely read or download from uh, social cognitive and affective neuroscience, which is the journal where we publish it. So, fMRI, uh, the images were uh, on display for two and a half seconds, then the question here was very simple. Is this image showing pain? Yes or no? And then we had a, a session in which we ask, how are artistically beautiful do you think the image is? And the images uh, in this experiment were of four kinds. Physical pain, no art. Pictures of human beings showing pain. No art neutral, neutral human faces. Art pain, the same images of the previous experiment, neutral art, neutral faces, again, from the previous experiment. And the results are quite interesting. The observation of facial expression of pain, both the artistic and non-artistic ones, activates brain regions related to empathy for pain, the anterior insula and the anterior cingulate cortex. But it's more than that. The higher the activation of empathy for pain brain regions, the higher the aesthetic judgment of artistic beauty of painful facial expression. However, there is no correlation between the aesthetic judgment and the activation of a visual area which specifically responds to faces, the fusiform face area. This modulation only occurs in the brain circuits related to our empathy for pain. Okay, I'm almost done. Man-made images are the locus of virtual interaction constituting a sophisticated form of mediated intersubjectivity. These elements are connected to the function of embodied simulation. The ways through which beholders connect to images are not just offline mental processes, but primarily online bodily forms of intersubjectivity, of the simulative kind. The meaning of images does not depend only on concepts and propositions, but it relies also on sensory motor schemas, which get the viewer literally in touch with them shaping a multimodal embodied simulation which exploits all the potentialities of our brain body, which is in a way it is marvelously and artistically captured by, by this great uh, filmic metaphor which uh, appears in the opening scenes of uh, Ingmar Bergman's uh, masterpiece Persona, where the child is touching the screen uh, where appears uh, the, the image of uh, Liv Wood. And body simulation as a model of perception imagination generates the peculiar quality of the embodied seeing as that plays a significant role in aesthetic experience. And it is, I argue, one important ingredient of our appreciation of human creative expressions. Cognitive neuroscience can bridge nature and culture, what we, as we speak nowadays, call uh, or designate as a biocultural paradigm by studying the brain body mechanism supporting both the creative process and the reception of its results. And I focus entirely my talk on this second part. By studying the brain body in relation to cultural artifacts and their reception, 
we can better understand the building blocks of aesthetic experience and the genesis of aesthetic concepts. And I want to conclude with a quote uh, from another of the protagonists of uh, American pragmatism, George Herbert Mead, who in a paper on specifically devoted to aesthetic experience that he published in 1926 in the Journal of Ethics wrote, the world of perceptual reality, the world of physical things is the world of our contacts and our manipulations. And the distance experience of the eye and the ear means first of all, these physical things. Uh, for those of you who are interested in this uh, biocultural approach, I invite you to uh, uh, go to Facebook and Google for the Neuroscience and the Humanities Facebook page or on the YouTube channel Neuroscience and the Humanities, where you will have a, a collection of uh, videos uh, pertaining to all the initiatives, uh, the conferences, the interviews, uh, the seminar that we have been organizing in the two and a half years of existence uh, of this uh, new lab, uh, which uh, I have the privilege uh, uh, to direct. And uh, this is all. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. We have a round of applause here in the, in, the, in the room, Vittorio. And, and uh, really uh, thank you uh, because there are hundreds of uh, possible questions here at stake. So uh, <laughs> we don't, I, but I really think to get into just for one brief uh, question for myself uh, with the other two. Uh, place there, which is uh, this. Uh, in your uh, research, uh, you arrive to um, to something like a personal motory vocabulary. So, in other in other um, uh, words, uh, can we um, witness an uncanny movement that uh, doesn't activate our motor um, motor brain if we have not this move in our vocabulary, or if it is performed by the human being? Well, to a certain extent, uh, uh, your brain can generalize by approximation. There are, for example, interesting experiments uh, showing uh, they did fMRI to individuals uh, that were congenitally deprived of their limbs because of the thalidomide uh, uh, drug, uh, which produced a, a mal fetal malformation. So these uh, individuals have no arms and no hands. So what happens to their brain when they see a hand grasping an object, for example? It leads to the activation, to the embodied simulation of the motor part of their brain that controls their feet and their mouth, you see? So this is the one way in which brain plasticity can adapt. Or another example, we train monkeys to grasp objects using pliers even inverted pliers, escargot pliers, that require in order to be operated opposite movements of the hand. So you squeeze your hand to open it, you release it to close. And we found neuron, grasping related neurons and mirror neurons that respond when the monkey grasps with the bare hand, but also when the monkey grasps with this tool. So the movement is the opposite, but the goal is the same. Okay, we also submitted uh, those neuron and the monkey containing the neuron to the observation of another kind of grasp that the monkey never learned, namely sticking the object. So some of the neuron respond also to the observation of sticking. However, they do so with the, a weaker intensity and with a much bigger time delay. So in other words, the most anticipated discharge is when the monkey see the hand grasping the object. Something which the monkey can map easily because it's part of its own uh, natural repertoire. Intermediate delay when she sees the grasping performed with the pliers, something the monkey had to artificially learn. Later discharge when the monkey see the sticking, which is not part of the motor uh, repertoire. So I would say that to a certain degree, because of the plasticity, to the extent that the goal is the same and the effector is the same, even if not 
the same exact type of movement, there is the possibility to... Then, of course, in our case, there are different ways of uh, embodying something. For example, when I see a, a, a Tintoretto, for example, I go to Academia. I was there in, in February. Nobody was around. So it was a quite uh, unheimly experience, but I, I could enjoy this giant round-shaped Tintoretto sitting on a couch for half an hour and noticing a lot of things that you normally wouldn't uh, uh, see if you just pass by. And those flying angels still convey uh, a, a sense of levity, a sense of elevation. How do we embody that? The, the short answer is, I don't know. I think it is partly a projection of something that we can do, like jumping, something that has to do what we learn through metaphorical mapping, through language. So it is a blend of bottom up and top down because you always have a blend. So what I have been talking about today is a almost entirely neglected part of aesthetic experience in the hand of conceptual art and uh, 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 the the ensuing uh, conceptual art criticism. Uh, Rosalind Krauss, just to uh, to to come up with the name and this this kind of things uh, or Arthur Danto and the like, where the body is not exactly in their hearts, uh, so to speak. But of course, I would be a foolish if I would make the bold claim all there is in aesthetic experience is embodied simulation. And sometimes people uh, uh, want to nail me to this, but uh, we try to be as explicit as possible, even in the first paper, to say, look, this is one aspect of aesthetic experience. At the very least, we are... We, we think we are beginning to understand what are the neurophysiological and bodily mechanisms that uh, underpin our empathic engagement uh, with cultural artifacts. When it comes to more cognitively sophisticated enterprising, like reading your mind, uh, we have the tautological statement that when I mind read, that part of the brain activates, which means that the mind reading module is sitting there but to me, this is, is total nonsense. It's phrenology, 2.0. No, uh, no, just wait a bit and uh, maybe if someone would like to uh, yes. take a question, I, I see Roberto Casati that... Uh, I see Roberto, uh, ciao Roberto. Good morning. And uh, uh, so, uh, we thank you very much, uh, Vittorio. I hope that there will be a uh, future occasion to develop uh, a collaboration with uh, your um, uh, your lab, and uh, so really thank you very much for having me. Thank, thank you, and uh, again, uh, ciao, Roberto. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye.